Crime is terribly revealing. Try and vary your methods as you will, your tastes, your habits, your attitude of mind, and your soul is revealed by your actions. Agatha Christie. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots. I'm Lee Hull. And I'm Lee Esses. And we couldn't start this particular episode with a quote from anybody except Agatha Christie. We're talking about mystery today. This is such a wide range genre, but it spans the ages. If you have a single hit book in this genre, you have an entire fan set for life, no matter what you write. Your subgenres of mystery are so much fun. You go back to the 30s, 40s, and you've got your noir detectives, you know, your femme fatales, and it's just rich and fun, full of MacGuffins, and I love it. (laughs) Another one of my favorites is your amateur sleuth, your P.I., You have that with Sherlock Holmes, people who are solving mysteries, one, because they like it, and two, because it's kind of a calling. It's not just a job. A subgenre of this subgenre is the cozy mysteries. It's your whodunits with a female lead. So a lot of your Agatha Christie, Murder, She Wrote, those are your cozy mysteries. Nancy Drew. That's very much the cozy mystery. It all happens in her hometown and she's just a waitress, but we all know she's Nancy Drew. You can also have your police procedural of your mysteries. I'm reading one that's kind of a mix between the amateur PI and the police procedural because it's this bounty hunter that works with a police officer in solving the mysteries. And of course, there's the YA mysteries. So she already mentioned Nancy Drew. You also have Goosebumps, which is a little bit of horror, fantasy, sci-fi, but it's usually based in mystery first. The Hardy Boys, same thing, where you can tap into that, getting the whole series for the kids. So you have a lot of famous authors in this genre. We already mentioned Agatha Christie. You also have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created Sherlock. Richard Castle. (laughs) Kind of. For those who aren't as big of fans as I am, Richard Castle was a character in a TV show who was a novelist who followed a cop around because he liked annoying her. But as a novelist, he wrote murder mysteries, and the makers of the TV show have actually released a set of books that are quote-unquote written by that character, Richard Castle. You also have James Patterson, R.L. Stein, and of course, right now we have to pay tribute to Mary Higgins Clark, a very well-known suspense mystery writer, passed away January 31st. So even though mystery kind of spans the test of time, nowadays you're only going to see it in a couple of different types of settings, a couple of different times. Most common, of course, is going to be modern. Your Mary Higgins Clark, your James Patterson, those are modern tellings. Murder happened, somebody investigates it. Probably my favorite subgenre is the noir, and that happens a lot in the 40s. So another time period that you see them pop up a lot in is the 70s. This is when we had a lot of the weird serial killers out there. That mostly has to do with the FBI crime database starting to interconnect. There was this fascination with serial crimes. And so you ended up with the Magnum P.I. type characters popping up all over the place. But really, it can be in any setting whatsoever. We were talking before the show that in Star Trek, they had a murder mystery. You could write it in ancient times where the story is about him bonding with a dog, and there can still be an element of mystery to that. The writing style for a mystery novel, usually you're going to have a very small tertiary cast. You don't want a lot of extras to mess with the potential suspects. Clue has about the biggest variety there because you've got that whole set of people, but that's about as much as you'll have in this mystery world. And a lot of that's because of Agatha Christie. She brought on the trope of the butler did it because they're an invisible member of the household that everyone just kind of looks over and doesn't really see them as a member of the suspect pool. You're also going to get a lot of very eccentric main characters. 
They have quirks. They have things about them that makes them a good investigator and a good sleuth, but not always good with people. Sherlock. Yeah. The sociopath who just looks at people and goes, oh, well, you're this and this and this because I can tell by the color of mud on your shoe. And it's totally weird and out there, but it makes them interesting enough to follow. I will put Sherlock Holmes in a room with anybody and it'll be a fascinating conversation or a really short one, more likely. (laughs) Somebody's bound to throw him out a window. So there is also in mystery a lot more showing than telling. It is the descriptions, the small clues laced in the words throughout the book that lead to that final ending of knowing what's going on. The whole genre lends itself more toward the plotters than the pantsers because they know what the mud on the shoe means when they're writing it, even if the reader doesn't know. The author should know, why am I putting this bit of detail in there? If you are pantsing a mystery novel, you're going to end up with a lot of Chekhov's guns. Or just a very annoyed editor, I think. That too. You also really need to do your research. Details matter in mystery. If you get something wrong about blood splatter and somebody notices that, it's going to be a problem for the outcome of your book, if that's a key detail in them solving the mystery. And it's going to be a red herring. So it kills me to say it, but plot your mysteries. Uh, When it comes to writing a mystery, this is also going to be right there with thriller suspense on short. 80 to 90,000 words. You go back to like Agatha Christie, and that's 40 to 60,000. That's because they're meant to be consumed and consumed quickly and just gotten through in one day if possible. How do you title a mystery novel? One of the most common things you'll see is a title about a place. So the house on the hill. The Orient Express. Yes. And sometimes it's pretty blatant. Sometimes it's the mystery of the blank. A lot of the Nancy Drew fall into that category. The mystery of the lock in the wall or whatever. Sometimes it's just a, I don't know what that means. I'll have to read it to find out. More often than not, especially if it's a procedural, if it's a series, it's going to be investigator name and the mystery of the blank. But as far as titling is concerned, mystery has some of the longest names out there. Covers for mystery are a lot of fun because a lot of the times on the cover, you can include details and hints and clues to the outcome of your book. Again, you're going to find a lot of the blacks. You're also going to find a fair amount of yellow and gold, whites, brighter colors that also have a dark twist. So reds, lots of reds for the blood and whatever. (laughs) If it's noir, you'll see some silhouettes. You'll get a lot of the shadow in some, especially murder mysteries. You'll have a shadow and then part of a body that you can see. That's an older style, but still somewhat common in the murder mystery kind of genres. And going back to that idea of having a core following and having them for life, your author's name is going to be very big on the page. As big as, if not bigger than, the title of the book. Because if you have a following as a mystery novelist, the name matters more than the title. People will read it no matter what it's about. Yeah. So let's wrap it up with the common tropes. There are some fun tropes in mysteries. You have the inheritance, the rich uncle that comes out of nowhere and they have to fight over an inheritance or somebody dies because of an inheritance. We talk about raising the stakes in your story. This is a very easy stake to have. It's like, okay, they're fighting over money. This is what the drama is about. Because it's something that everybody relates to. You also have the everyone is a suspect, especially if they're all trapped in a building with a cast of strangers. So your police have blocked off the building and nobody's allowed to get out until we know who the murderer is. You're going to get a lot of red herrings, shaggy dogs, and Chekhov's guns. And this is the time to do it. It lives for mystery. Yes. One of my favorite tropes, and this is more about props than it is about like actual storytelling, 
I love seeing the surly eccentric main character with the hat down low, standing in the shadow of a corner and then like smoking something. He's musing, but he's doing something with his hand still. This is also very common in your noirs. And probably the most common is the Scooby-Doo. There's magic going on. No, it's just a shady real estate guy. And I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you darn kids. (laughs) Whereas in a lot of your other stories, something that's normally explained by science is actually magical. This kind of slings it the other direction of, well, the house is haunted and cursed. No, he just has like a projector and like fishing line. Yeah. Even though we said that this is a genre you need to plot in, you can still have a lot of fun writing the mysteries. Plotters have fun. Do you, though? I do. Just like we've said for the other genres, if you want to write mystery, go for it. Kill people to your heart's content and then make somebody solve it. And a part of mystery that's so much fun is your audience really participates in a way that you don't see in most other genres. You want them guessing. You want to toy with your audience as much as possible. And that's a lot of the fun of writing. It really opens up the opportunity for you to always write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. <laughs>